much? How much was squeezed? We're going to get started. Should I be recording too? Put your phone down. I'm teaching. I'm teaching. Okay. So, um, Okay, so I got a couple of closing comments on spinners and gamma matrices and so forth. Um, and then I'm going to turn to actions and action principles. And we're going to look at the actions governing uh, spin zero particles, spin a half particles, and spin one particles. But I got a few things I got to say about uh, gamma matrices. Um, so we know that um, gamma mu. Oh man, oh crap. Anybody got a decent black marker? Because I think I got another one of those. Oh, oh, this one's okay, this one's okay. I'm okay. Okay, gamma mu is, um, it's a matrix which has the unique property of linking space-time because it has a it has a space-time index mu which carries the values t x y z, okay. But it also it what it does is it links space-time to spin space. So in spin space, what kind of object is this? It's a it, it's a matrix. It's a matrix, right? Um, the thing is, is we're not going to label its components in this class. We're just going to largely understand everything with these gamma matrices and spinners as matrix multiplication. But today is the one exception when I'm actually going to write, uh, or I'm going to notate the the um, the rows and columns of this thing. Um, so you know, we might say that this has got some spin indices A, B. How many values do these take? Four. Are they TXYZ? No. So remember we have four component spinners in four dimensions and we have four component vectors, but the components of vectors, while they're associated with the coordinates TXYZ, the components of the spinners are not. Um, now, uh, you might ask yourself, well, is this thing really a vector? Because it's got these spin indices. It turns out that this by itself is not a vector in the sense that it's more complicated than that, but this could be used to create a vector in the following means. So, um, it's a lot of words on this sheet. It's really hard for me to teach from a wordy, unless I stand here and read it. Technical aside, spin space is tied to the geometry at hand. In fact, just as vectors actually live in the tangent space at each point, or tangent bundle over all of space-time, spinners live in the spin bundle over space. This is bullshit. Anyway, um, sorry. Okay, okay. So uh, I'm gonna I'm going to um, remind you of a couple of things. So first of all, if we have a vector and we want to transform a vector, we know how this transforms. Uh, it just transforms with some lambda uh, mu prime mu times the original vector, and then we have a spinner. And it transforms as e to the i over 4 sigma mu nu, omega mu nu, psi. And what I'm going to do is instead of writing that, because that's a handful to write every time, I'm just going to call this s of lambda. What this means is we're doing a space-time transformation. So there's some lambda matrix that's associated with it, some Lorentz transformation. This means you take that Lorentz tr transformation and you spinify it. You turn it into whatever that transformation looks like acting on spinners. It looks like this, but I just don't want to write that, okay? My point is if you go and you rotate a physical system, you rotate all the vectors, but you also rotate all the spinners. Everything rotates. It's just to enact the rotation on vectors, you use the Lorentz matrices or a rotation matrix. But to rotate a spinner, you have to use a special form, okay? And these look different. So this is just going to be the spinorial realization of a Lorentz transformation. Um, okay, so to understand how gamma mu can act as a vector, 
Um, so I'm going to restore indices. So now I'm going to write the following. I'm going to say that psi A goes to psi A prime, where A is a spinner index. And this is going to use the spinner transformation, except we're going to give it indices. And then as you're all aware, if you want to build an invariant, you use the dual spinner, which we defined last time. Whoops. Lower B. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay. How are these two things related? What do you think? I gain zero? Or what? How is this functionally related to this, Ross? Um, I believe they're matrix inverses of each other. Yeah, they're matrix inverses of each other. I gotta get my cards because I'm gonna have to call on somebody. Did you name up the quiet? No, you're not being quiet. Oh look. Madison's Hi. Do you come here often? Uh, some Tuesdays and Thursdays. Nice, nice. All right, that's cool. It's getting kind of hot in here. Um, <laughs> it's getting kind of hot in here. Uh, anyway, okay. So, I believe it's only referred to as steamy. So, if we want this guy to. Oh, shoot, man, I am. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, I tell you, finishing up with a topic um, versus finishing up with a topic versus starting a new one is always hard because it's just like residual ideas to the ground. Okay, there it is. Uh, this guy needs to be what? Kronecker delta AB. Yeah, it got to be Kronecker delta AB. Okay, so as you pointed out, this is the inverse. Uh, this is the inverse of this. Should that be A prime B? Is that what that's supposed to be? Yeah, it should be, okay? Because th the reason is because um, these are A prime A prime, and these are A A. If I made this A prime uh, well, it, it won't really work, will it? Because these two matrices have to share an index in order for them to be multiplied together. So I'm just sharing the A prime. And, but I don't want to call this A because this A would be summed with this A, which is summed with this A, and that's three A's, and that's, two, that's not good. You only, you only want a, a repetition twice in the Einstein summation convention. Okay, so now um, let me... Where's my gamma? Okay, so we're gonna label gamma uh, with its uh, indices and then we're gonna carry this through. So let's see. Um, okay, so, um, so now what I wanna consider is what is, oh man, so nervous. Uh, what is often called a spinner sandwich. Uh, and yeah, this is one of the reasons I'm nervous today because I spell sandwich wrong. Um, this is a spinner sandwich. <laughs> I know, yeah, I'm gonna do it anyway, I'm gonna stick with it, God damn it. Okay, so the spinner sandwich, the idea is the following. We're gonna have a dual spinner and we're gonna have a spinner and then tucked in between them, we're gonna have spin matrices, okay? But since this thing is kept by bread of a dual and a spinner nature, what kind of spinorial object will this thing turn out to be? It will be a vector. It will be a vector. It won't have any spin structure. It's the same as taking a vector and contracting it with a dual vector, in which case this is a scalar. Okay. The, the combination of these creates something which is invariant, okay? So this thing 
because it's a dual spinner and a spinner, it doesn't matter if I cram a spin matrix inside, the dual vector and the, uh, the dual spinner and the spinner kind of wrap it together and, and the output of this is a scalar with respect to spin space, not with respect to space time because there's a mu index here. Okay? So, let's see. So first of all, let me write down how gamma mu should transform. So I'm going to give gamma mu an upper and a lower spin index. That'll just make more sense when we're multiplying. Um, but here we go. Gamma mu prime, A prime, B prime. So gamma mu has three indices. It has a space-time index and it has two spin indices. All of those indices have to be transformed if we're going to do a Lorentz transformation. Okay, but they all transform in different ways. Well, they don't all, well, they do all transform in different ways. So we know how the mu index transforms, lambda mu prime mu. We know how an upper spin index transforms. And we know how a lower spin index transforms. Okay? And then if we wanted to write this so that matrix multiplication was at our disposal, then what we would want to do is Do it like that. That way the A's are adjacent and the B's are adjacent. Okay. So in terms of taking this transformation, which is written in the index notation, so you can put any of these terms anywhere you want. If you want to get them ready for matrix multiplication, you need to write it like this. Okay, with the transformation of the first index on the left and the transformation of the second index on the right. That's the same thing you encounter with tensors. Okay. All right. So here's the thing though, when we transform tensors, or sorry, when we transform these gamma matrices, we are not going to illustrate them with spin indices. So that means that to transform this thing, you've got to know that it's got a vector index, but then you just have to understand that it accepts these matrices. as part of its transformation law. Okay? But it gets better than that. All right? Because it turns out that since the gammas are always going to appear in spinner sandwiches, <laughs> you guys, you gotta laugh because this shit's gonna get way funnier in a few minutes. <laughs> since these exist inside of spin sandwiches, you actually don't even need to address those transformations for the following reason. Let me show you. So imagine that we create a spin sandwich like this, okay? Now the spinners have indices, but we're not going to write them, and the gamma mu has spin indices, okay? If we transform this, then psi bar transforms into psi prime, gamma mu prime, uh, psi prime, and now if I transform all of these, well, how does psi bar prime transform? It transforms a psi bar S lambda inverse. This is the transformation of this. And then we have the transformation of gamma, which is S lambda, lambda mu prime mu S lambda inverse. I'll just continue down here. And then we have the transformation of the psi prime, which is S lambda psi. Yeah? Um, I think, is, isn't there supposed to be like a gamma mu factor of lambda mu prime mu? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll squeeze it in here. There you go, good. All right, what happens? Not everything. A lot of things go like What that. remains? The space time transformation is all that's left. Okay? 
So the, transfer, the technical transformation of gamma includes spin transformations of its spinor spinorial indices and the, the transformation of its vector index, okay? But we can just, because it's always going to be stuffed in a spinner sandwich, which is always going to be overall invariant, we can just ignore that and say, this quantity transforms with this, therefore what kind of quantity is this? It's a vector. It's a vector. It's a vector built out of spin, spinorial objects. Okay? And it probably comes as no surprise that we can take these spinners and we can build all sorts of things. We can build a scalar, we can build a vector, and what do you think? Yeah, it's a tensor. Okay, but I gotta ask people questions from the cards. Okay. What do you think? We good? Ready to leave leave spinners behind for a little bit? Talk about actions? Yeah. Okay. We are going to work with spinners extensively throughout the course. Um, but it's time to turn into actions. It's getting hot in here. Take off my neck. Anyway, um <laughs> so sorry, it's just hot in here. It's hot outside too, Jesus. <laughs> So warm. Um, anyway, <laughs> all that whispering. <laughs> you guys shut up. Okay, actions. Actions are where it's at. Okay. All right. So. Um, oh, you look like a man of action. That's what you look like. Oh yeah. <laughs> now, thanks for the stress. Hey okay, guys, <laughs> you look at the board. Not in my legs or my ass. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a pretty tall order. <laughs> All right, shut up! I'll put your card on the top of the deck and glue it there, damn it. Okay. Uh, various forms. <laughs> okay, the action principles are really awesome because they allow us to generalize our approaches to things. So, for example, if we're doing uh, non-relativistic mechanics and then we decide we want to do relativistic mechanics, then what we tend to do is take things which are defined uh, as spatially moving things and they're parameterized by time, and we instead consider things which are integrated over space-time, a game of D4X. Um, you might find that you need to migrate from working with particle uh, physics to a theory of fields. And if you do that, then your degrees of freedom move from where the particle is as a function of time to what is the field configuration over space-time. Okay, so, you know, field. All right. And then lastly, if you want to go from working with things classically to working with them quantum mechanically, then your adjustment is to, instead of going from an action principle, where you write down an action and say the variation of the action is zero and that gives rise to the equations of motion, rather what you do is you use the action as a weight in an exponential, which is integrated over all the field configurations, and this is, of course, the path integral idea, okay? 
Now, one of the key reasons why we like to work with uh, action principles, and action principles, by the way, are sort of, you know, they have the Lagrangian as a key part of it. Um, and one of the reasons why working with Lagrangians is really nice is because they're invariably able to reflect the symmetries of the theory. Okay? And hopefully by the end of the semester, if you don't learn anything else you learn, symmetries play an important role. Okay? The space-time symmetries, the uh, internal symmetries that give rise to the forces. So um, I'm going to say a few preliminary things about these and then we'll dig into the guts of them. Um, the action is a functional. And I am going to have, oh look, Jack. <laughs> Perhaps glued onto the top of the deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is a functional? Functional is something that takes a function as an input and I think gives a scalar as an output. But I don't yeah, know. no, that's exactly right. So we know what a function is. So we know that a function um, grabs an argument and returns a number. So for example, f of x equals x squared. If we input x equals 2, then it returns a number. Okay, a functional, you hand it a function and it returns a number. Now that might seem weird, but there are actually some very simple ones. So one is simply integrate from zero to one, whatever function you put in. So if we put in, for example, x squared, and we're integrating from zero to one, And we got one third. Okay. So the point is, functions you put in an argument, and it ends up giving you a number. For functionals, you put in functions, and you can put in any function you like here. This will, this integral works for almost any function, and you integrate it with uh, defined boundary conditions, and you'll get a number out of it. Okay. Now, what makes this nice is that in the same way that we can extremize functions. So we extremize functions by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero to find the value of x, which extremizes this function to find the one that has either the highest or the lowest functional value. We can do the same thing with a functional. Okay, You're not quite taking a derivative, so we give it a different letter. We give it delta instead. Okay. Um, but by setting the variation of this to zero, and we'll do the variation in just a minute, by setting the variation of a functional to zero, you're finding the functions which extremize the output of the functional. So you'll either get the largest or the smallest values coming out of the functional. Now, where most of you should be familiar with this is, of course, Lagrangian mechanics. So in Lagrangian mechanics, the action is the integral of the Lagrangian with respect to time, where your Lagrangian is normally just the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And then if you say that the variation of the action is zero, then from this you can derive the Euler-Lagrange equations. How many of you are familiar with this? Okay, good, good. Okay, I'm getting comfortable. It's <laughs> not, no, I'm not. That's a joke. Um, anyway, okay, so any questions about this before we uh, generalize it? No? Okay. So what we want to do is we need to relativize this story and we need to make it uh, good for quantum use. So, that's what I need. Uh, so here we go. So 
We're going to talk about actions, Lagrangians, and equations of motion for relativistic fields. Okay, so what are we going to read? What are we going to do? All I want to do is is play this as a as an analogy game or a grow up game, okay? We're gonna take our starting point, which was right here, and everybody admitted they were familiar with, and we're just gonna bump everything up. So we're gonna do some replacements. Q of T, all right? This is the generalized coordinate of a particle. Okay, you use Q's because when you're working on Lagrangians, you might or might not be using X, Y, Z, so you don't want to use those labels. So we just use a label Q for the generalized coordinates. But remember, when you're working with a particle, its position as a function of time is kind of a solution to the problem, and that's why we work with that. But we want to work instead with fields, so every, everywhere we saw Q of T, we want to replace it with a field that is a function over all of space-time. Okay, it's not a position that varies with time, it's a field that is, it can vary over space and time. So everywhere we see Q2, we replace it with phi x mu. Later we'll introduce different kinds of fields. This is just a generic field for now. Okay, uh, Q dot. Pick another victim. Andy! Where are you, Andy? Is Andy here? Avery! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you almost look as bad as I do, but you got a big black box on. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Avery, what do you think I replaced Q dot with? So how about partial phi, partial x mu? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty close to what you just said. And then lastly, we're going to replace our integral of something over dt with an integral of something over d4x. Okay. All right. So at the end of the day, our action is going to take the following form. I'm leaving out the possibility of time dependence because the possibility of time dependence is in there. You don't have to separately encode it. Okay? Now, eventually we're going to want to quantize with this, and so we'll talk about using it in a, in a path integral. But it turns out that getting the equations, the classical equations of motion and using them is actually as equally important part of how we work with this in particle physics. So we're going to spend some time doing that. Uh, first, we won't, we won't path, integral, path integralize it until considerably later. So, um, so I want you to consider phi as a function of x mu and a region of M. By the way, what I'm about to do, in case you're wondering, is this is an action written in terms of an arbitrary Lagrangian. Okay? To, to specify your physical theory, you have to give me the Lagrangian. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the Lagrangian completely general, and I'm going to derive the or the Lagrange equations in motion for you. Okay, something you should have seen in your intermediate mechanics class, but you probably didn't. This is not going to be a repeat of that because this is for relativistic fields. I'm pretty sure you did not work with relativistic fields in intermediate mechanics. You work with non-relativistic particles. So there's going to be new ingredients here, okay? But the theme is pretty much the same, okay? So uh, consider the, the field phi x mu in a region of M, or region M, of space-time with boundary conditions 
phi x mu on the boundary of m. Okay, so what do I have in mind here? Well, we got all of space-time. Sorry, we've got all of space-time. Uh, yeah, it's m4. Okay, but what I want to do is I want to pick out a subregion of it, and then that subregion has a boundary. Okay, and um, you might remember that when you're working with uh, the non-relativistic Lagrangians. Even in going from an action principle down to the equations of motion and certainly solving the equations of motion, you always have to give boundary conditions, right? You have to say it's starting out moving this direction with this velocity, that's a set of boundary conditions. Or I want to, I want to understand how it moves from point A to point B, those are boundary conditions. So we have to specify boundary conditions on fields, so one way to do it is to just draw a surface and give the fields value along that surface. Okay, these aren't at points, this, is, this, this thing is defined over all of space-time, and so we need to give its value over some surface. Okay. So now, um, now I want you to consider a deformation of the field, which is the original version of the field, and this is a generic field, but we take the original version of the field and then we're going to deform it, okay, but the deformations are going to be such that this thing obeys the same boundary conditions, okay? So phi prime x mu So if I want that to be true what can you tell me about this thing on the boundary? It has to be zero. It has to be zero. That's a very important observation we're going to use that later. Okay. So this tells me that delta phi on the boundary has to equal zero. All right, here we go. Are you ready? Good. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to consider the variation of S. So vary this guy then what we're going to do is we're going to take the partial derivative of L with respect to phi and then multiply that by the variation of phi. And we're then going to take the partial derivative of L with respect to d mu phi and consider the variation of the derivative of phi. Uh, this should be over d4x. If you just, if you squint your eyes and you say to yourself, this whole thing is a function of phi and d mu phi, and I want to take that derivative of it, I take the derivative with respect to phi and multiply it by d phi, but it's delta phi because phi is a function, it's not a, a variable. And then you take the derivative with respect to this next guy and multiply it by the variation of that. Okay? All right. Now, Here's an important thing that we're going to do that you did in your intermediate mechanics class, and it is sort of the, it's, it's the underpinning to getting this thing to work. We got to take this and we've got to integrate by parts. Okay? So if we're going to integrate it by parts, then we're going to use the following expression d by dx mu of partial L, partial, partial mu phi, delta phi. Hmm. I wonder why I'm doing that. Well, let's see. Uh, if I take this and I just hit this, I use a product rule. Uh, 
Um, I can always push this derivative inside of this variation, so this would end up becoming. Why can't we just push a derivative inside the variation? Yes. Okay. Wait a minute. Hold on. I thought I was integrating by parts. Oh, wait a minute. This is this. So I can replace this by this minus this. You guys know how to integrate by parts, right? How do you integrate by parts? Like no, you folks, you integrate by parts by using the product rule and then just moving one thing to the other side. That's what integration by parts is. I know, and it really pisses me off that you don't see it. So if you want to know the integral of this, Then you do the integral of this minus the integral of this. Okay, and there's some dx's and shit that I'm missing, but that's that's the basis of integration by parts. Okay. I say that because if you're in some weird new context like relativistic field theory and you got to integrate by parts and you're scared, just remember you just you're doing a damn product rule and then you're moving one term to the other side. So don't worry about it. But anyway, okay, so if I move that to the other side, then my expression for delta S is going to be the following. Um, yes, okay, so I got minus D by DX mu partial L partial partial mu phi. I don't guess I need brackets around that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I do. Just to make sure I don't act on that with it. Um, and then plus this guy. All integrated over D4x. Is that an R over there uh, is, these are L's, sorry, they're, they're Lagrangian densities, technically. Don't you complain because I'm not going to do it the way you do it. So put your hand down, Ross. Well, I wasn't going to complain. I was just going to give you the answer. Yes, but I'm not going to do it the way that you do it. So I'm gonna, I want to just shout it up here. <laughs> um, okay, so this is going to be... Basically, this guy evaluated on the boundary. So it goes to zero because delta phi is zero on the boundary. Yeah, exactly. Remember, delta phi is zero on the boundary. So this term vanishes. Now, you might ask why that's important, but here's the important observation. If we take what we have left, it has a common factor of delta phi. So if I just take out that delta phi,
then I get to make the following argument. This delta phi is arbitrary. Okay? I mean, the only condition it has to satisfy is that it vanishes on the boundary. So if you want this expression to be equal to zero, because this is delta s, and this guy is arbitrary, what is the guy in parentheses going to be? Zero. Well, there's the equation of motion. Which you should recognize is very similar to the Euler-Lagrange equation that you looked at in intermediate mechanics. All right? Remember in intermediate mechanics, it looked like this. All we've done is we've replaced Q with phi, d by dt with d by dx mu, and Q dot with d mu phi as promised. So you could have literally taken the non-relativistic version and just done all these substitutions and gotten here, but I wanted you to see the derivation. Okay? And this is, of course, called the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion. It's still a Lagrangian, or an Euler-Lagrange equation of motion, it's just got a different context. Okay. Any questions? about this. Yes. The conditions that you can use this, are they like in your main mechanics where you have like a conservative system and every once in a while you can bludgeon a non conservative system into it? Um I would think yes, but I don't remember exactly the issues that non-conservative systems give us in the non-relativistic point particle case. Do you remember? No. no mostly about the energies. Yeah. yeah. Energy decreasing all the time. Yeah. That's harder to do. Yeah, we haven't even defined energy here. We're about to, but. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The, 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 the questions that you ask in non-relativistic point particle physics often just, they can become non-questions in the relativistic setting is, is the funny thing. And so I don't even know if it's an issue. And if it is, I'm not sure how it gets resolved. So I'll have to think about that. Um, OK, so let's go. Yeah, we've got half an hour. OK, so we might be able to finish. Um, OK. <laughs> All right. So Uh, you're probably familiar, and now I'm going to say a few things about what the Lagrangian might look like. So you're familiar with the idea that uh, in non-optimistic settings, you use kinetic energy and potential energy uh, the difference in them to specify your Lagrangian. Um, Now, in a, in a non-altivistic setting, there's many different ways that you can get a potential energy. For example, you can work with a two-component system. So you have two particles, and then they are experiencing a, a force interacting. And then you can derive a potential from that. OK, so you can have a complete system where you have degrees of freedom and the interactions between those degrees of freedom. Or you could just take a particle and study it in the background of some induced potential, for example, gravity. You know, when you want to study a, a something that's moving in the influence of gravity, you rarely include Earth as part of your system, and you just have the potential energy due to Earth. All right? Um, for our purposes, we will uh, 
normally be associating in this context the potential term with the interaction between objects in the theory. There's not going to be a big background and then the particle move. We're going to be looking at the interaction between particles. So that's the context in which we want to work. So what we're going to do is instead of thinking of it this way, we're going to break the Lagrangian into a kinetic term plus an interaction term. Okay? And the plus here, it, it, it's, it's not important. The minus is important here because you've specifically defined what potential energies are and then how you're going to combine them with kinetic energy in order to get the equations of motion and how they're going to be consistent is fine. I haven't even defined this for you yet. Okay? So I might as well just put a plus in there. And then maybe with an actual expression for interactions, we might find that it needs to be negative, but it's not that important to think that way right now. Um, okay, so we're going to start, we're going to finish today talking about this. And then next time we'll get into this, and this is going to be beautiful, okay? But we've got to get through this today. This is often referred to as the free particle action, because if you imagine a particle that's just zipping along, or a field of which this is a fluctuation, okay, if there's nothing for it to interact with, then it's just going to have kinetic energy. It's actually going to have energy due to it having mass as well. Um, and but this thing is moving along freely. It's not interacting with anything. So we'll also call that the free Lagrangian. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the free Lagrangians for the three different types of particles that we're going to see in this class. And then next time we'll talk about how we generate interactions between them. So, all right. Free Lagrangians. In classical physics, Your free Lagrangian probably would have been one half mv squared, okay? The kinetic energy term. And after all, if you're removing any interactions, then you're removing that guy, okay? Which, of course, you could also define if you wanted to in terms of p, it's p squared over 2m. But Lagrangian uh, mechanics, you have to talk in terms of velocity and not momentum, but those are obviously the other. Um, So, um, yeah. So, uh, this, this free Lagrangian term is designed for a massive particle. Okay? Does it work for a massless particle? No. Okay? Um, we would like an analogy for possibly massless relativistic fields. Okay, it's got to be relativistic. There's no non-relativistic formulation of anything in this class. We're not doing particles anymore, we're doing fields. And we're going to encounter numerous fields which have zero mass. And so we've got to come up with an expression which actually works even if m is equal to zero. Now, there are three cases. There's the scalar, the spinner, and the vector fields. Okay, spin zero, spin a half, spin one. That's all we're going to encounter um, in this class. Of course, if you do general relativity, you get to spin two fields and so forth. But if you want to know what plays the roles of these,
all matter is represented by spinner fields. And when I say matter, I mean the stuff you're made of. Okay, electrons. Protons, but protons are made of quarks. So quarks. Quarks are spinners. Electrons are spinners. Okay? Vectors are going to be the transformation rule for the force particles. These are, I've got two electrons and they're interacting by the electromagnetic interactions that they're going to swap in a new particle, which is a vector field. Okay? Anybody know what's going to play the role of a scalar? No, no, we have to be able to deal with massive and massless spinners, massive and massless vectors. Go ahead. Uh, the Higgs field. Yeah, this is the Higgs. The Higgs field is the only scalar field that we work with in the standard model. Okay, and we will work with it. But literally, these are the three huge categories. Remember that very first day when I did an overview of the standard model and I did a, a breakdown? And this was God, this was matter, and this were forces. And God is, of course, Higgs. Okay, that's also a breakdown in the spin. Okay, so we're going to need all three of these. Now, I'm not going to derive the free Lagrangians for each of these. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to write the three Lagrangians down, and then we're going to write down their corresponding equations of motion using the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, you can derive them, but historically, some of them were just guessed. Okay? So I don't really, I don't really think that taking the time to derive the forms of these three Lagrangians is really beneficial. There's going to take enough time just to write them down and write down and extract from them their equations of motion, which is going to play a very, very important role in our analysis to come. So starting with spin zero, or scalars. Yeah, let me think how I can organize this. Yeah, I can do it this way. Okay, so here we go. Here is the Lagrangian, the free Lagrangian for a scalar field. Now, the first thing you should notice is, first of all, it has derivatives of the field, which kind of play the role of the kinetic term in in the non-relativistic Lagrangian. Right? So this is kind of like the kinetic term, but it doesn't have mass in it. The mass sits over here. Okay? So in a non-relativistic particle context, we have the, the derivatives multiplying the mass, but here we get them separate. And the reason for that is because if we have a bump, the fact that we've got an excitation in the field phi, and those excitations cost you a bit of energy if the field has a mass. Okay, just having this exist, period, think of rest mass. You know, if the thing exists, whether it's moving or not, then you're going to have a contribution to the energy. But then you also get contributions to the energy based on how this field is varying over space, time. Okay. Regardless of how you interpret it, what's the nice thing about that expression? It's better than one half mv squared. It's field theoretic, so it doesn't depend on like a velocity of the particle. No. I mean that's nice. Uh, Anthony. What can 
can we do with this that we could not do with one half mv squared? Exactly, we can have no mass. We can look at a field with zero mass, it's still got a well-defined free Lagrangian. You just set this term to zero, okay? So having the mass split up from the derivative is actually an advantage. Okay, so I'm gonna rewrite this slightly. And please, please remember whenever I write something like this, that is shorthand for this. Okay, where the lower index here corresponds to the upper index and the bottom here. We never do the coordinates with lower indices. They're just a no-no, except for Ross. Ross put them sometime, but the rest of us won't. We'll always do coordinates with an upper index because the coordinates are tied to vectors and vectors come with an upper index. This, of course, creates a dual vector because it's a quantity with a lower index. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm introducing the metric so that I can drop that mu index down and then I have to reaccommodate that with the metric and uh, yes, okay, all right, so let's do this. So we're going to do dl d phi minus d by dx mu DL D by D phi equals zero. That's the generic form of the Euler Lagrange equation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could be wrong about this, but I think that there's supposed to be a negative sign on the first term, so like negative one half partially P partially. Uh, no. Negative sign on here? Yeah. That totally depends on the convention that you're using. So it's not, it's not the convention that I'm using in this class. It might be in a quantum field theory textbook, but it's not in this context. Trust me. Okay. All right, so uh, here we go. So let's start with D by DL by D phi. I, I'll tell you what, I'll do one of them if you do the other. I'll do this one if you guys do this one. Is that a deal? Okay. Oh, good, sweet, awesome. So DL by D phi, Oh, wow. Boom. Are y'all done? You're doing this one. Which has got two of these. Yes? Oh, I, I did it. Don't make sure ready. Um, and this is, I think, what I was saying is that if we have, if we have the positive sign, then uh, the, the, it's going to be negative uh, a and u e partial u partial u phi because of the minus part d uh, because the second term has a negative sign there. Yes. Mm, about the uh, but then the klein gordon equation. You, you're getting way ahead. You're getting way ahead, and you're not necessarily correct. So let me finish. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. All right. So uh, did you guys do this? Can you tell me which kind? D mu phi. Okay, I'll, I'll just write it down. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So, um, actually, I'll just write down the entire expression. What the entire expression is. D minus uh, dx mu. So there's. MC over H bar squared phi. And then we do this one at a time, okay? We'll do this one first. So we're taking, because um, this is, this can be varied into nu or mu, okay? So we get D by DX mu, um, partial L, partial, partial mu phi minus d by dx nu, partial L, partial, partial nu phi, so if I take the derivative of this with respect to d mu phi, well I just get this stuff that's left over, and then the 
if I take the derivative with respect to the derivative with respect to nu, then I get this stuff. Okay? And the reason I'm doing this is because I just want you to see there's a there's a sign there's a sub a superscript game that plays out perfectly fine. And these two terms give me the same contribution. So the one halves combine, and I'm left with something I can just label as, uh, oops. Okay. Yeah, one half eta is a constant, so this derivative just comes in and hits this, and so that gives me d nu d nu. This one comes in and gives me d nu d nu, but we know we can swap the order of derivatives. Okay. Uh, normally, we take this and we use the metric to raise one of these. Do you disagree with that? I think I figured out what the problem was. I, I'm just used to the plus minus convention. That's yes, yes. So this is what's called the Klein-Gordon equation. Klein-Gordon. Klein is in Klein bottle. All right, so this is the equation of motion satisfied by a free spin zero or scalar field. And again, it's perfectly valid if we take the mass to zero. All right, now I'm going to skip spinners for a moment and go on to spin one. And again, I'm not going to derive this, I'm just going to write it down and then we'll bang out what the equations of motion actually look like. Okay, it's going to look very different. Very, very different. Okay? You might remember there was an addendum that I put on at the beginning of the next lecture where I talked about how electromagnetism, if you want to relativize it, um, you've got different ways you can make things four-dimensional. You can take the potential and the vector potential and combine them into a four-component object, okay, which is the same U. Or you can take the components of E and B and form a four-by-four four matrix, which is actually what these FMU news are. Okay, so both of those approaches are going to take place here. All right, so if you want the equation of motion, the thing you have to realize is that the F is built out of the A's. So the only field in this thing is A mu. I mean, yeah, there's an F there, but it's just built from A mu. In fact, it's built from derivatives of A mu, so that will play a natural role. So, if we want the equation of motion, then we need, yeah, this is pretty much what it looked like for here, 
except we're just replacing phi with a mu. But if we're replacing phi with a mu, then I need to change this mu into a different index because I don't want this to be mu, mu, mu. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll tell you what. I'll do this one if you guys will do this one. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Hell yeah. Uh, you guys are not takers on the love that I send your way every single time. Okay? And I just want you to realize that the index structure plays out. I'm taking the derivative to a lower mu. That's a lower mu. Oh, wait. There's two a's there. You got two different approaches to doing this. You can just squint your eyes and call that a squared. And then take the derivative of a squared, which gives you a factor of 2. And then it leaves you with an a. But does it leave you with an a upper or a lower? Another way to do it is to write that like this. And then take the derivative with respect to a mu and then take the derivative with respect to a mu, okay? It doesn't really matter. I'm, we're not, we're not going to worry too, too much about the details. Um, you might wonder what, though, is this? Yeah, so in order to do this, and that's a very good question, I'll follow up in just a moment. But in order to do this, you have to take the f's and replace them with this and with this. Actually, replace, uh, replace this guy with this, and then replace this with this, OK? I'm just going to write the answer. Because you're going to derive this in your homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's adventurous. Okay. So this will be in your homework. But again, I just want you to realize the indices are in the right place because you're taking the derivative with respect to something with two lower indices. Wait, hold on. Oh, sorry. This should be up, upper mu. Two lower indices on this side in the in the thing with which, with which you're taking the derivative with respect to translate into two upper indices on the right hand side. Okay, it's the same. It's the same as we did here. Okay, where we said if we take the derivative of something, we end up with a vector. Okay. No, sorry, 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 sorry. No, sorry, 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 sorry. Don't pay attention to what I just wrote. That was crap. Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, then what we have is, of course, uh, the derivative of this with respect to mu. And I can take the four pi's and cancel them because everything's equal to zero. And so this is going to give me a glorious equation that looks like the following. Okay, remember, I have to take the derivative of this derivative with respect to x mu, and that's just going to be held in this d mu term. Where did the one of the go? Well, there's one here, and there's one here, and their sum is 0, so oh, okay. just cancel them out. All right? So this is what is called the Proké equation. The Proca equation is the field equation which governs electromagnetism if there are no particles, there's just the, field, there's just the electromagnetic field, and the electromagnetic field has mass. If you want this to reduce to ordinary electromagnetism, what should you do? Take it to zero. Yeah, if you, if you take it to zero, then you just get ENM, which is rooted in this equation.
If you actually broke this down, if you wrote F mu nu in terms of E and B components, I don't know what the hell that noise is, but it's loud. They have band practice. Oh, story. yeah, okay. Maybe I'll go have a chat with them and let them know that we have class. But anyway, um, if you plugged in the matrix here with E and B components, and then took derivatives and set all equal to zero, you're going to get equations for E and B. What do you call those equations? Half of Maxwell's equations. Okay? These will actually give you the del cross B and the del dot E equations. Okay? But the other half of Maxwell's equations are actually conditions that arise from non-dynamical aspects. They're actually reflections of the electromagnetic geometry. Um, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Because I've got to finish very quickly with spinners. Spinners aren't that hard. Okay. Any questions about spin zero or spin one? Okay, so spinners, go like this. Let's start with their free Lagrangian. And by the way, in, I think it's going to happen a little later in the course, C and H bar are both going to be set to 1. So all these factors of C and H bar that we're encountering are eventually going to go away. Now, we're going to treat psi bar and psi as independent variables. And we'll have more, uh, we'll discuss this more later on. Um, that means that the way that we should, the way that we should look at this free Lagrangian is that it's a free Lagrangian of two different fields. One is psi and one is psi bar. And that's not intuitive, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, so if we vary with respect to psi bar, well, first of all, you should already notice something interesting in this Lagrangian. Psi and psi bar are not treated the same. Right? You're taking the derivative of psi, but you're not taking the derivative of psi bar. They're the same here. But here they're very different. Here's the amazing fact which I'm going to prove to you in less than five minutes. You're going to get almost the exact same equation of motion for psi and psi bar. So let's see how it works out. If we vary with respect to psi bar, what we get is the following. So uh, there's no d mu psi bar, but there's only d mu psi. So this term is zero. Oh, I was going to do that one. <laughs> As I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad you had the insight. In <laughs> okay. If I take the derivative with respect to psi bar, I just am taking everything multiplying this. So this times this and then this times this, and that's give, this gives me this. This is the contraction of the index, the vector index on the gamma mu with the index on the derivative. This is going to have a nickname in the future. It's called d slash with no vector index because the vector indices are summed over when I contract the d mu with the gamma mu. Okay? So at the end of the day, this is going to take the form d slash psi plus mc over h bar psi equals zero. That is called the Dirac equation. I know. All right. So at last, we're going to vary with respect to psi.
First question, is this zero? No, there is a Demius side. Okay. And the derivative, the derivative with respect to psi is going to look different than the derivative with respect to psi bar. Because there's no psi in this term, there's only d mu psi. Okay. So in the end, this term is going to give us mc squared psi bar, because it's just acting on that term. And then this term is going to give us minus d mu h bar c psi bar gamma mu equals zero. which gives us the d slash psi bar minus mc over h bar psi bar equals zero. This is the adjoint. The biggest difference is that minus unit. Okay. You guys should hang around. I'm going to go over there in this and kick their asses. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, might say shorts. something. Huh? <laughs> They're what? Are all those breakaway shorts. You chase them off. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, okay, so look. So th there, is, there is a lot that we're going to do with this material. So you really want to become comfortable with this, okay? First of all, though, I'm going to give you a wonderful lecture, which I rarely ever see. And it is going to be figuring out why these Lagrangians and equations of motion look different. I'm going to give you a means of interpreting why the spinner equation looks different than the Klein-Gordon equation for scalars, why the vector equation looks different. And it's a, it's a discussion I've never seen written up. Okay. But moreover, when we want to introduce interactions, this is where it's going to be really beautiful because it's going to turn out that we'll start with these equations. And then we'll just make one massage to them. We will make them invariant under a local symmetry transformation. And in doing so, we're going to be forced to introduce gauge fields, and then we'll get interactions out of them. So this is really, you know, this is field, these are theories describing free particles, but they are the fundamental starting point for generating the interacting theories, which of course is what we eventually want to talk about. All right, some more on that next time. Has everybody got their quizzes back? <laughs> something to me.